rock god Lenny Kravitz. I, I never thought about being the star. I just wanted to play. Goes deep about his debut memoir. Lenny, what made you write this book now? I wanted it to be about finding my voice and that journey. His love for Lisa Bonet. That's what Let Love Rule is. That's what it's about. We live that. Who's your most unlikely celebrity friend? Okay, uh, there's a friend of mine. Hey, Lenny, welcome to the show. Thank you for doing this. Thank you. It's a pleasure. So, uh, so where are you? Tell us where you are. I'm in the Bahamas, sitting on my porch with my dog, Jojo. Lenny, what made you write this book now? And how did you decide to write a book only about part of your life and not about the whole journey? Firstly, I never thought to write a book. I, I never thought that I would do this. Um, but through a mutual friend, I met David Ritz, who uh, helped me write this book. I thought, you know, this would be a challenge and this would be interesting and something that I never thought I would do. And as I began to write it, I realized that I, that I didn't want it to go past the first album. I wanted it to be about finding my voice and that journey. We uh, what made you decide to go and make music a career? I mean, I know you said you love music and I've heard you say before how much there was kind of a really rich mix of musicians that you love. I never thought about being famous. I was just playing. I was jamming with people. I was listening. I, in school, I was involved in the orchestras, the band, the marching band. I was living music. I was quite prepared, I think, to be a musician in any capacity. If I was playing in a club, you know, backing somebody up. Like, I, I never thought about being the star. I just wanted to play. So many tears I cried. So much pain inside. But baby, it ain't over till it's over. Did you have confidence once you did decide that, that you could hear your own voice and the songs were coming to you, that you were gonna be a star? I know you said that you didn't set out that way. I honestly never thought about it. I just, I knew that I knew that I had found my voice and my sound. I made the first record without a record deal. And so then when I began to shop it, most people didn't understand it. It took a, it took a minute. And I finally met these people at Virgin Records that understood it wanted to sign me, and I still wasn't thinking about stardom. I was just thinking about getting out there. I, I had no concept of that for myself. You know, you played smaller concerts to start. You're playing in clubs and then theaters, and uh, people came to the shows knowing the music. I, I, I'd never experienced this. What I really want to know is I assume, Lenny, part of it was the look, too. Is that right? It was all of it. It was the music, it was the message, it was, yes, it was the whole, it was the whole expression. All of these songs and all of these albums really do stand for that time. I just can't get you off of my mind. And, and what about uh, Fly Away? Well, how, did, uh, how did that come about? Flyaway was written here in the Bahamas. Uh, I was in Nassau at the time. I was driving Zoe to school. She was a little girl. She was in the Bahamas with me for that year while I was making that record. I put her in a school there. And I used to drive her back and forth to school along the ocean. And uh, it was a beautiful ride every morning. I just started to hear this thing by driving by the ocean and taking in all of this vibe from the Bahamas. Went in the studio and just picked up a guitar and it just came out. I want to get away. I want to fly away. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. How did you become such a good dad? Because I feel like you and Lisa did that, um, conscious uncoupling thing before it was a phrase. You know what I mean? Like you guys were like the Brangelina couple of your time and rather than have something that looked messy, it looked like 
you guys split in a way that ultimately was as good as it probably could be. And I always felt like I was watching you guys be good with your daughter. Is, is that is that what was real and what was true, or did it take you a while Absolutely. to get what, to a good place? What you see is what it is. We are we are one family. Yes, we you know we split back then. Worked it out because that is what you do. For us, there was no choice in that matter. You know, it's a blessing. Been wonderful for Zoe to be able to see her parents like that. I forget that people don't operate that way in so many cases and and you know people make all these comments and they're so blown away by the fact that we all hang out together and that Jason and I are so close and that you know we're all so close and and but we don't think about it it's just it's normal and it's real that's what let love rule is that's what it's about we live that Lenny, talk to me a little bit about love I mean obviously uh, both the album and now the book let love rule you care a lot about love. What have you learned about love uh, over the course of your life? And if you were going back and talking to a young Lenny, or maybe if you're talking to Zoe, like what kind of advice do you give about love? I mean, love is the most powerful energy that there is. Love is everything. Love is the answer to everything. Love is our purpose for being human beings. Love is the highest of all highs. And have you enjoyed this ride? I mean, from, from here, looking from the outside at you, it looks like you've had a beautiful ride. And even more so, honestly, as I've read your book, it feels like there's a lot of richness to it. When I hear you talk about Cicely Tyson or Toni Morrison or some of these people who were in your life or I saw, uh, uh, I'm a boxing fan too, so I love that you had the gloves from uh, Frazier and Ali and all those kinds of good things and all that kind of richness. Has it been that good a ride? No, it's been incredible. Of course I've had other dynamics, but I have to say I had a blessed childhood. You know, a lot of people that I talk to look back on their childhoods and they they don't look at them the way I do. They, they, they had a very hard time. Their childhood was not that for them. And mine was, was amazing. The you've been dreaming about this car since you were eight policy from American Family Insurance. Where, though? You grew up in New York, right? I grew I was born in New York. I was born in Bed-Stuy, Brooklyn, and I was raised between Bed-Stuy and Manhattan on the Upper East Side, which was quite a contrast. And, uh, and then I moved to L.A. when I was 11, uh, when my mom got the Jefferson. Well, we're moving on up. We're moving on up. We left New York. We went to L.A. We thought it would just be for maybe a year, uh, and it ended up being 11 years. Louise, I finally caught you at home. It's all your fault. I'm fine, thank you, and how are you? Wow, what was that like to see her take off uh, as she did? Because I remember her as a kid uh, watching her, and I, I enjoyed that show, and I loved uh, watching her. And so years later, as you broke out, it made me smile because I still had a little bit of your mom uh, on my mind. What was that like for you, kind of being right there in the mix and seeing her take off? Well, it was, it was interesting because I, she was obviously, she was acting in New York. She was a theater actress. She was in the Negro Ensemble Company. And uh, she used to do off-Broadway plays and ended up on Broadway in a play called The River Niger that uh, was a big hit on Broadway. She was nominated for a Tony Award. And then we went to LA. And after the first season, the show was a, was a huge hit. And she, you know, became recognizable. And that's when everything changed because, you know, just going to the store, living life, doing things, you know, people were all over her. So that was a, that was a new dynamic of fame, of Hollywood, which uh, was very different for her because she wasn't, she wasn't part of Hollywood. It was her job. 
And she always let me know, like, you know, this is my job, uh, but this is not who I am. And what did that do for you as a young person seeing that? I mean, I know you've talked about a lot of influences in your memoir. Uh, you talk about all the various people who influenced you, but seeing your mom have that level of, of, of success, is that part of what put you on the path to becoming a musician or were you just cheering on your mom like anybody would? Music, music was always in me. I think what it taught me was how one deals with that dynamic. Because, you know, she was a grown woman at this point. She wasn't, you know, she wasn't a kid. She dealt with it with grace. It, 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 was, it wasn't an easy transition. I saw how one could deal with that, deal with fame, but not let it get to your head, staying humble and uh, staying focused. What were you like as a kid? Because I read a number of the excerpts from your book and I heard you talk about Manhattan versus Brooklyn. Heard you talk about mom versus dad. I heard you talk about uh, the Jackson Five and James Brown uh, versus uh, Jimi Hendrix and others. But like, who would I have met? If I had met you at eight, nine, 10, what kind of kid were you? I was a typical New York kid, you know, going to school, playing in the park. Uh, Central Park was my backyard. Uh, playing stickball in the schoolyard. Uh, I love sports, I love baseball. Uh, I was a big New York Met fan. I used to go to the games with my grandfather. What's wonderful about growing up in New York at that time was the independence that you get at a young age because you're taught to take the subway, to take the bus. And I used to go around as a kid, you know, you went where you had to go and you did what you had to do. And uh, it was great, it was the 70s in New York City. It was, it was vibrant. Lenny, one of the things that I'm always thinking a lot about and, and particularly trying to talk to young people about is how you go about dreaming fearlessly. What kind of advice do you give people when they inevitably ask you about how to dream fearlessly? It's hard for folks, um, for a lot of folks, because you are constantly being told how to be, what to do, how to act. No, that's not who you are. This is who you are. But you really have to, you really have to be headstrong. You know, you have to have a strong spirit. Not every door that is open is the door that you should walk down. Turn down four or five record deals. As a teenager who was living in a car, I don't quite know how I did that, but it was the spirit inside of me that led me. In so many cases, these people wanted me to not express myself the way that I wanted to. We're gonna give you this deal, but you, you can't do what you think you wanna do. You're gonna do this because this is what sells. This is what gets on the radio. This is what a black artist does. And I don't know how I said no, uh, even as an adult. It's like, wow, how, I, how did I have the strength to say no and turn these deals down one after the other? That's, that's the spirit, that's that voice. But then there was also a, a power that gave me the strength and the discernment to not walk through those doors. Lenny, talk to me a little bit, if you would, about race, because as I was saying before, you, you probably have really interesting perspective on it, having lived all around the world, all around the country, being the son of, of a mixed marriage at a time when that wasn't super common, but then now living in an era of Obama, of, of uh, Patrick Mahomes, of Kaepernick, of all sorts of things. How do, how do you see both your experience as a young person uh, being, uh, being a mixed child and where we are today. In growing up, I, you know, I was very fortunate that I wasn't one of the mixed kids who, that was confused. I, so I saw a lot of confusion in people that were biracial. I didn't think anything about it. I loved it. 
I embraced who I was on both sides. I was taught to do that. But what my mother did, which was very smart and interesting, was that when I was very young, she said, okay, I am this, your father is that. She explained it to me. I want you to be just as proud, you know, both sides. You are no more one than the other, but society is going to only see it in this way. And taught me about what that was like, that folks weren't gonna see the mix, you know? I identified as black, of course, and, and uh, but I knew who I was and who my father was and his history of being a Russian Jew and where they come from and but it was but it was all good. It was just it was just a rich mixed bag and I I, I loved it. Lenny, how do you think about this moment we're in right now with all that has happened in terms of Black Lives Matter, these fresh conversations? Are you left with hope? Are you want to be hopeful, but there's a part of you that, that thinks we are where we are? It amazes me where we are. We are, we're just lost. Unbelievable to me that we are in 2020 and we haven't figured out how to work together. But it's very sad to me. It's very sad to watch that with all that we've been through, how far we've come in our evolution, how far we've come with all the things that we've done and accomplished, and we still can't figure out how to all be different, but live on the same planet and work together. And instead of being afraid of the differences, embrace them and respect them, and we all live our lives. You know, it, it, it blows my mind. What's your favorite meal? My favorite meal? Yep. I suppose, well, I've been here in the Bahamas, so in the morning, just getting into the uh, into the mangoes, man. Uh, favorite collector's item? I own several things by Jimi Hendrix, and I have uh, a complete outfit of his, one of his uh, outfits that you've seen in pictures. That's, that's pretty special. Um, who's your most unlikely celebrity friend? Who would people be surprised to hear that you're friends with, um, that you know a little bit? Uh, okay, uh, there's a friend of mine uh, named Big Show. He's a wrestler. Oh, oh, what a knockout blow! Folks that know wrestling know him. I would have never met him in, 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 in my life. Uh, our circles are completely different, but uh, we met through a mutual friend. He's uh, He's a, he's a dear friend at this point. Hey, hey Lenny, I want to close out by asking you about your foundation. Uh, what made you decide to do it? And what, if anything's made you most proud? The Let Love Rule Foundation is all about just helping folks in need, wherever, however. So a couple of the things that, that, that I do with that foundation here is medical and dental care uh, to people on the island for absolutely free. We have, a, we have a whole clinic that we set up here and the best doctors and dentists from New York City that work on Fifth Avenue come down here and take care of the people free of charge once a year and they do a beautiful job of it. They make the people feel really special and they know that it's a blessing for them to serve these people. Man, Lenny, I'm glad that you were doing that and uh, uh, you made me love uh, Let Love Rule even more than I did before. It feels like uh, it's got you. some extra resonance so uh so bless you and thank you for uh, uh thank for, you. i hope this won't be the last time i hope you come back and do the show again i would love to thank you very much hey i hope you enjoyed that rock star i mean lenny was great i really liked him before but now i'm a huge fan even a bigger fan what an interesting person i love the story of his grandfather i hope you did as well you know i'm going to teach you the best i know and then you teach me 
What a blessing to have someone like that in your life. I loved how clear he was about what a good dad he needed to be. To Zoe, I mean, it shows up, but just the fact that he was so certain about it, I thought was wonderful. He talked a little bit about his mom. I almost wish he had talked more because I know she was a special woman. And I love that he was just born to that kind of rich soup of artists, whether it was Cicely Tyson, or I'm gonna call Muhammad Ali an artist, or all the other people who were in and around his world. I loved all of that. And then it was interesting to me that he talked about writing a book as being cathartic, as being better than therapy. Something good maybe for us all to remember. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this show. And if you did, I hope you'll do the three things. Hope you'll subscribe, hope you'll tell a friend, and definitely, definitely, definitely listen to this podcast. It's a good one, really, really good. I'll see you soon. Hey, tune into The Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're gonna enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.